Networking across, as advised by actress, writer, producer Issa Rae, involves tapping into your existing network to complete projects with laterally positioned, like-minded individuals before approaching larger institutions. The intention of this discussion is for the participants to share their experiences with increasing organizational capacity through partnerships with other similarly, similarly positioned organizations, as well as fostering equitable community engagement. Additionally, we will discuss how to manage the expectations of funders and other stakeholders alongside project goals and organizational capacity, and how to set boundaries with larger organizational partners. My name is Sinatra Smith, and I am the CLEAR DLF Postdoctoral Fellow in Data Curation for African American Studies at the Philadelphia Museum of Art Library and Archives and the Temple University Library's Loretta C. Duckworth Scholar Studio. I earned my PhD in Global and Sorry, Global and Sociocultural Studies with a concentration in Anthropology from the School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University. My research focuses on the creation perpetuation and transformation of the socio-political intersectional black cultural landscape, landscape with special attention to the ways in which virtual and physical space are used as environments to conceptually and practically transform black identification processes, as well as the material culture that contributes to this phenomenon. To begin, I will introduce each panelist and ask that they give a short overview of their project, and then we will begin our discussion. So first, we're gonna start with Carol Smith, She's an independent curator and archivist who has worked with a number of Philadelphia's institutions. She has a BA in American Civilization and an MA in Material Culture from the University of Pennsylvania and is a certified archivist. Long-term clients include Christ Church Performance Trust, Preservation Trust, sorry, the Philadelphia Contributionship and the Carpenters Company of the City and County of Philadelphia, also known as Carpenters Hall. She is the past president of the Historical Society of Haddonfield and also works for Fireman's Hall Museum. Carol, you were the co-PI for the Christchurch Preservation Trust project entitled Digitization, I'm sorry, Digitizing the Records of Philadelphia's Historic Congregation. Can you share a little bit more information about that project? Absolutely, and thank you for asking me to do this. This is a three-year project which we're extending for a fourth year. And we are scanning and placing online in unified websites the records of 11 of Philadelphia's historic congregations. They, they're the oldest congregations within the city, the old historic section of the city, and they include Gloria Dei, Christ Church, First Baptist, Vicva Israel, um, St. Peter's, St. Paul, St. George's Methodist, the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, and the First, Second, and Third Presbyterian Churches. All but one of these congregations is still active, although First and Second Presbyterian churches have moved, and some of the records are in collecting institutions. The Presbyterian Historical Society holds the records of the First, Second, and Third Presbyterian churches. The Episcopal Diocese holds the records of St. Paul's, which is now a closed church, and the First Baptist records are at the American Baptist Historical Society. But the remaining congregations manage their own records, and as you can imagine, Archives are not a primary or even secondary function of these organizations. So uh, their ability to make these records available to researchers is limited. This project enables us to help those congregations uh, by making the records readily available to a worldwide audience, providing them with a preservation copy to ensure uh, the better survival and protection of those original records. And it's a great opportunity for researchers to see the records in context and to provide them with the means to look across denominations. So the records we chose to scan were the sacramental registers, the baptismal, marriage, burial, circumcision records. Um, great interest to genealogists, but they also provide a snapshot of social conditions of the times, the records of deaths during the yellow fever epidemics or the smallpox epidemics. Um, the baptismal records of Native Americans, free and enslaved Africans, um, and occasionally the marriage, and in rare cases, burial records of those same groups. The trustee minutes reflect the social and political upheavals of the time. We originally planned to scan 41,000 records. We've since been able to add to the project by harvesting scans of the Quaker records from Haverford and Swarthmore College that have come off of ancestry contracts. 
Um, records can be viewed on our project website, philadelphiacongregations.org, or through the American Theological Library Association's digital library, and long-term preservation is being provided by OPEN, the University of Pennsylvania's Special Collections Libraries. So that's it in a nutshell. Excellent, thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Laurie Taylor. Uh, she is the Senior Director of, for Library Technology and Digital Strategies. She provides leadership for technology and partnerships with the University of Florida Libraries across the university, regionally, nationally, and internationally. She works closely with colleagues to sustain collaborations for building collections, community, and capacity, including for the Digital Library of the Caribbean and Library Press at, at US. Her work is geared toward enabling a culture of radical collaboration that values and supports diversity, equity, and inclusion. And Laura, you were the co-PI for a collaborative project between University of Florida, University of Puerto Rico, and the Digital Library of the Caribbean entitled Film on a Boat, Digitizing Historical Newspapers of the Caribbean. Can you share an overview of that project with us, please? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Film on a Boat is a really exciting project. Um, it builds from so many, so many years and decades um, of collaborations across the Caribbean. Um, this project is led by the University of Florida in collaboration with the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, um, and in collaboration with the Digital Library of the Caribbean. So it focuses on unique materials held at the University of Puerto Rico and the University of Florida. For the reason the book, the reason the project is entitled Film on a Boat is some of the, the microfilm that's held at the University of Florida dates back to the 1940s, the 1950s, and 1960s, where the University of Florida put a librarian on a boat. She sailed around the Caribbean. She, he, it changed over the years. Um, and they microfilm materials. And the agreement was, we're going to microfilm this. We'll have a copy at the University of Florida for preservation and access forever. And y'all will also get a copy. And so in some cases, the other copies have been lost. In some cases, they're still there. But you have, if you have even two copies in the world, that's only two. And how do you get them from the different islands? You still got to put them on a boat. You got to put them on a seaplane. You got to put them on a commuter plane. It's really, really hard. And the records for these, they were done, you know, at times, obviously, of low budgets, as we're always um, facing. And so sometimes, there's just the title of the microfilm in terms of like the cataloging records. If you know where to go, there's a list of the microfilm. What exactly is on them? Um, you know, where do you find this list? How do you how do you even get started on this research? If you already know people, you can get into it, but there's still lim limited information on it. So film on a boat was how do we really make good, you know, on those agreements on these decades of collaboration? Okay, we need to digitize this in mass. Um, we need a ton of material. So um, in the U.S. collections, focusing on the Anglophone Caribbean, Puerto Rico, uh, obviously uh, materials in Spanish, to digitize 800,000 pages of newspapers. And so in doing so, this is a this is a field changer. I mean, this how many stories can be uncovered? How many things that we don't know? How many you know? Oh, we're looking for this literary figure, and we can't find other materials, but we think there's something about them. Enabling that kind of research, enabling the collaboration. We're super excited as the materials go on online because we're going to be working with the different ministries departments of education and of tourism making sure that everyone has access to their cultural heritage materials and working together so we're super excited awesome and our third panelist is holly smith um, she is the college archivist at spelman college she received her ba in history and black studies from the college of william and Mar mary and an ma in history from yale university and an MS in Library and Information Science from Simmons College. She co-authored the article, This Black Woman's Work, Exploring Archival Projects that Embrace the Identity of the Memory Worker, and authored the piece, Radical Love, Documenting, Documenting Underrepresented Groups Using Principles of Radical Empathy. She's passionate about community archives and archival advocacy related to collections for historically underdocumented group communities. Holly worked on a collaborative project between the Atlanta University Center Selman College, University of Georgia, and Morehouse College entitled Our Story, Digitizing Publications and Photographs of the Historically Black Atlanta University Center Institution. Thank you so much for joining us, Holly, and can you share an overview of your project? Good morning, everyone, and again, a huge thank you to Dr. Smith for this uh, invitation to present with my colleagues today. So the uh, Spelman Archives, uh, Spelman College, which Spelman Archives are a part of, were part of a collaborative project that's come to be known as Our Story. And it was a collaborative project between um, the Atlanta University Center Robert Woodruff Library and the Digital Library of Georgia, as well as Morehouse College, to digitize publications 
as well as photograph collection from the schools in the Atlanta University Center. Um, when I mentioned the Atlanta University Center, AUC, it's the largest consortia of HBCUs in the nation that consists of Spelman um, College, Morehouse College, Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse School of Medicine, um, and it is also it, and it also historically has included the inner Interdenominational Theological Center, please excuse me, <laughs> as well as Morris Brown College. So we received a grant from uh, CLEAR, the Council of Library and Information Resources, in 2016. So we are, um, what's I, what I think is interesting about our conversation here is we are really on the tail end um, of completion of the project in terms of the actual digitization of materials as well as presentations such as this. Um, conferences and other uh, webinar and symposia. So the project included publications from the Atlanta University Center and speaking specifically around Spelman, we have uh, quite a number of publications, over 500 volumes that have been published from the founding of the school really in 1881 to the present, such as course catalogs, um, a publication called The Spelman Messenger, which really documents the school, as well as thousands <laughs> of photographs really. And often, which is the, the case at most historically black colleges and universities, uh, I say HBCUs for anyone not familiar with the term, that's what it means. Uh, this is the only place where you're gonna see the history, not only of uh, the HBCUs in the archives, but also surrounding um, black communities, multiple, because um, you know, community is very diverse and rich, as well as the staff, uh, students, faculty, and other constituents of the college. So it was very important to do this type of project, um, particularly thinking about historically what the uh, AUC has represented. So the, um, and I know we'll get more into the nuts and bolts of the project later, but Spelman, we were a partner. Um, so materials were digitized from the schools that I mentioned that were currently in um, historically part of the Atlanta University Center and Spelman, uh, in addition to our publications, including our catalogs, yearbooks, there were also about a thousand photographs that had been digitized from commencement, buildings and grounds, and um, the drama and dance program, which was, uh, and it is still renowned. And I think most of the important thing, hence the CLEAR grant, a lot of these materials hadn't previously been seen before. So it certainly amplifies, like you said, the experiences of the students and the faculty and staff at HBCUs has been used for genealogical research, for dissertation, and particularly in this era of uh, pandemic and COVID, um, it's been very critical to have these materials available, downloadable, and searchable. Absolutely. I'm sure we're all experiencing um, how important it is to maintain access to these records when we can't do that in person. All right, so lastly, we have Christine Dean D.C. McLeave with us. She's an enrolled citizen of the Turtle Mountain Ojibwe Nation, and she is Chief Executive Officer of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Christine's grandfather attended Marty Catholic Indian Boarding School in South Dakota and Haskell Indian Boarding School in Kansas. Additionally, her great-grandfather attended Carlisle Indian, Board Indian School Boarding school's intergenerational impact on her personal life and children's lives in general led her to complete her MA in leadership research on the spectrum of spiritual practices between traditional Native American spirituality and Christianity, as well as the legacy of boarding schools on spiritual activities and Indian activism today. The National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition is currently working on a project in partnership with the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan, Museum of Indian Arts and Culture and the Indigenous Digital Archive Project. Christine, please share more information with us about your project entitled Digitizing the Records of U.S. Indian Boarding Schools. 
Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, yes, it's quite a um, large undertaking. <laughs> So um, the mission at the Boarding School Healing Coalition is to address and understand the ongoing trauma of the U.S. Indian boarding school policy. And um, although that sounds very succinct, it's quite, um, um, it, it's quite a, a, a big mission. So this is to uh, um, both understand and address that, that U.S. policy. So in the United States, um, we have found uh, 367 boarding schools thus far. And we continue to find boarding schools here and there. Um, a year ago, the list was 357. So <clears throat> that research was done by us and, um, and independent researchers because we asked the United States um, Bureau of Indian Affairs how many boarding schools they had in, in this country under this policy to remove children from their families, to assimilate them into Western culture, and they were not able to respond. We also, as part of that Freedom of Information Act request, asked um, how many children went to those schools and what was the fate of those children. We often get um, tribes or tribal members uh, relatives and descendants asking us about um, their relatives boarding school experience. Um, in the past, people have had to travel all over the country to various federal digital archi uh, federal archives to try and, and look at these records. And then um, in terms of the, the number of schools that we found, um, we have not been able to locate even all of those records. So there's, there's, there's many layers to this. Um, so there's, there's what we know, and then um, there's what we don't know, and what we know we don't know, and what we don't know we don't know. Um, and so basically, you know, the records that we have found, we're trying to digitize those and make them accessible on a digital platform so that people don't have to travel across the country, not only relatives of these um, students who were taken to these boarding schools, but also researchers. We know that in Canada there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and they were able to um, get all the records and analyze them and come out with a seven volume report. Um, and you know they were able to find out how many children died or went missing at those schools. And here in the US, we're, we're just trying to chip away at um, this mammoth project. So this particular um, grant it's part of this larger effort to create a national Indian boarding school digital archive, NIBSTA for short. And um, we have 367 schools to get the records for and digitize. So we um, think it's a hundred year project. And um, this particular grant from CLEAR, which we are extremely grateful for, is focusing on eight boarding schools schools and um, we are in partnership with the tribe of the Saginaw Chippewa as well as the Indigenous Digital Archive down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Since um, Saginaw Chippewa tribe actually had a boarding school <coughs> um, on uh, near the reservation there, um, the Mount Pleasant Indian Boarding School, and they were looking to digitize those records anyhow and so we wanted to partner with them um, both so that we weren't competing for the grant funds, but rather partnering. Um, and also because we want, we want them to have the records. Uh, we, we believe in tribal data sovereignty, which is the right for indigenous people to control the data about their own citizens. Um, but we wanted to also see if we can get aggregate copies of the data so that we can link it on our digital archive since we're trying to make it a national digital archive. That is an amazing project. Very, very um, ambitious in a great way. 